It's always struggle because new souls face new choices. Sometimes good men go bad. Tiredness, weakness, fear. Giving up turns the tables. It's always struggle. Some know how to keep fighting on. See, despair happens. Fear happens. You start to think, how can I ease up, relax, and enjoy the good things? Some never give up. Some know how to go away and come back. More determined, more clear. Struggle Mountain ain't got no top. Struggle Mountain is for climbing. A black hand, a white hand, a moving train. A brother helping a brother. The important thing is to keep going. The important thing is to never give up. It's easy to view our world as fragmented, as broken, as hopeless. Simply turn on the TV and you can see it for yourself. We view the world in decline, a cascading nightmare that leads only to our own self-destruction. Most, most people just don't pay attention, uh, either because they think everything's hopeless. I mean, it's kind of driven into your heads that everything is hopeless. There's nothing you can do. The powers are too great. This film is about refusing that end. It is about hope and overcoming oppression. It is about taking a stand and helping those around you to their feet. It is a story about community power, solidarity, and the ability for people to speak for themselves. But mostly, it is a story about stories and how everyone has something of value to share. I'm gonna need to You know, that very confrontational aspect of what a lot of people think of as activism, civil disobedience and stuff like that, that's certainly part of it. But activism can also be theater. And I think that's one of the things that a Romero troupe has really shown is that uh, there are more ways to engage people than just um, confronting power directly. So I feel that I'm making a contribution by uh, acting out things that have to do with social justice, like the prejudice against uh, um, people of color, against gays, against immigrants. It's a feeling that you're accomplishing something worthwhile. And there are all these conventional ways of, of organizing, and I think what I've, I've learned in my brief time with the Romero Troop is that actually the Romero Troop itself constitutes a way of organizing around issues uh, of social justice and is not just a, a sort of dressing to that organizing, um, but is, uh, is a, a kind of central player. When you come to see the Romero Troupe, um, you're not passive. You, um, you may want to be, but you, you're not. Um, you become part of the performance. It really feels like the, the audience and the troupe, everybody becomes united and one. In 2013, I spent a year with a Denver-based community theater known as the Romero Theater Troupe. The project began as my master's research for the Department of Anthropology at Portland State University, but it quickly grew into something much larger. Coming from an anthropological perspective, I began to understand that the Romero Theater Troupe is so much more than a left-of-center activist theater. Through solidarity, power, and a space for self-representation, the Romero Theater Troupe is transforming the very culture of Denver. My 
God, my Lord. Well, here we are with 900 people in this grand hotel ballroom. But today, the Romero Troupe is going to remake this space from a space of privilege to a space of the people. We're going to bring our screams and our cries and our songs and our stories. And when we're finished, it will be redefined, we hope. The mission of the Romero Theater Troupe is to resurrect that important history and to preserve it and to bring it back to the people. On September 21st, 2013, the Romero Theater Troupe performed for the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Annual Women's Conference. What do you, what do you mean organized? I'm taking you on a walk! Follow Mother Jones! The conference, held in downtown Denver at the Regency Hotel, marked a shift in the audience of the Romero Theater Troupe as they performed in front of their largest audience to date, 900 people. We got to bring this thing to a boil. We got to bring this thing to a head. And this is what we came up with. And believe me, they're dumb as a stump. This is going to work. <laughs> yeah. We're going to fake them out. We're going to draw all of the company dinks and finks and the dance guard and the cops over to number nine. While they rush over there, we're going to take number four. That's the Chevy engine plant. No engines, no cars. They got to come to the table. Oh, that's a great plan. Yeah. 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 Let's take away the horsepower. That's going to work, man. You know, the only, only way they're going to get me out of here is a, in a box. That's the only way they're going to get me out of here. <laughs> You're committed, aren't you? Yeah, right. A box for a quarter? A box for a, a quarter? You guys. You, you know how long, how many times I've read the book of Genesis? Six times. Six. I stink. You stink. A quarter out in a box? <laughs> Stuck in here? I must be out of my mind with a bunch of poles and wops and negroes. I must be out of my mind for a quarter? Come on, Lester. Yes, come on. You come on. With this red talk, I'm sick of it. Lester, I'm, I'm, I'm Lester brother. It's okay, man. I gotta tell you something. I gotta tell all you guys something. I'm freaking scared. You're scared. Lester, you're scared. And you know what else? The National Guard, look at them. They're all out there. Hundreds of National Guard, and they're scared. Your cousin Billy, he's out there. You know what else is scared, Lester? Henry goddamn Ford is scared. He's scared you're going to look yourself in the mirror and see that you're a good man. He's scared that we're going to win this thing. Your daughter's scared that she's going to have to live the same life as your wife lives. Lester, we can win this thing. I'm from the Women's um, Emergency Brigade, <laughs> stationed in Flint. <laughs> And we're going to help you win this strike. Hey, Lester! I got a message for you from your wife. She said, if you don't stay in here until the end and win this thing, don't come home. Fear, if you conquer it, then and great things and growth happens from it. That, that fear isn't just like the end, that, that you grow from it. Oh gosh, what do I do with all of my fear? Well, my fear is turning into anger and I'm just n having trouble understanding why is this shit still going on today? <laughs> actually make a difference like you and I can yeah we could totally start a whole rippling effect and affect everyone you know what we should start in our neighborhood we should start a shoe drive yeah we're gonna we that should would start be great a, yeah. and we can do 
so many other things. Mother Jones, that, that was incredible. I want you to teach me something. I want to learn the Facebook thing. <laughs> but the Romero Theater Troupe's humble origins began with a classroom. The classroom of Dr. James Walsh, a professor at the University of Colorado at Denver. I decided to use theater to teach history. And I, I threw out final exams, midterms, textbooks, and lectures. Anything that didn't feel empowering, I threw away. And it got me in a lot of trouble, but I didn't care. I didn't care. I, I was determined that I was going to develop a radical classroom, a classroom where students owned the room and felt that ownership in every dimension possible. And so it was really, that was really powerful for me to hear that and to be able to bring something to life that had such close meaning to me was, um, was an opportunity that I hadn't had before, especially as a part of a more traditional like U.S. history or Colorado history class where you have to st study a lot of dates and names and instead you get to bring, bring your part to life. And so um, when Jim did that, I was like, that was fabulous. And he, and he said, um, yeah, so I do this, you know, often with a group of people called the Romero Troop. Um, would you be interested in doing that with us? And I said, yeah, do you need a headshot and a resume? <laughs> and and um, do you want me to prepare a monologue? Like that kind of thing. And he was like, no, it's not that kind of gig. So as most, I'm assuming everyone knows, like gay people aren't E they are considered equal still in our nation, and I mean, only nine states in our in America have passed legal law for gay marriage, and only last week were civil unions passed in Colorado, and so it really shows that gays still are being discriminated against. Yeah, the next semester, the students were told they they were put in groups and asked to create drama, theater, about events and ideas that we were discussing in the class. The results blew me away. A new voice emerged. It, in, our, in our intellectual discussions in class, didn't engage them, but being on stage and putting themselves in someone's shoes in history and almost spiritually feeling someone engaged them. I knew that this was something very special and I was never going to, to um, go back, ever, whatever the consequences. After a few years of that, the thought in my head was, well, I want to I take this history, this history of, that has not been revealed in textbooks, the history's not been told, uh, that history t to the general public. That was going to be my dream, and I thought, well, theater's, theater's the way, theater's the way it's going to happen. I started calling former students who had acted in my classes and, and it pitched the idea, and they all jumped at it. And a small group of us started with, we were invited to, perf to perform a, um, a kind of a biography of Oscar Romero's life here at Regis University on the 25th anniversary of Romero's death. We didn't even know much about Romero at all. Most of us never heard of him. I, I had just heard of him. I didn't know much more. And so in the process of learning about him and putting together his, his story theatrically, we we were just taken with his story. He's a man who started as a conservative, um, really a tool of, of, the, of the Salvadoran government at the time. He was appointed because he was a yes man. He was their guy. And as, as the oppression in El Salvador grew and as the, the violence grew and one of his friends was murdered, another priest, a fellow priest, the poor were being terrorized. Romero decided to he couldn't, he couldn't remain that role, and, and he, he, he switched. He went to the other side. He started, he started criticizing the government. He started speaking out on behalf of the poor. He started raising his voice, and he was murdered for that. That night of the show, we didn't have a name for our troop, and someone said before they introduced us, popped their head back between the curtains and said, Quick, what do you call yourself? I said, The Romero Troop. And so that's how it started, um, with that little show that we did. 
And from there, from those seven, it's just grown proportion. It's, it's unbelievable. I still don't quite understand the, the physics of it and the, and the spirit of it. It's kind of just like a ride we're all, we're all along for. Since that first performance on the life of Oscar Romero in 2004, the troupe has performed more than 35 full-length plays with attendances ranging from 100 to 300 people. There are currently about 60 active performers with more than 200 that cycle in and out of the troupe. Jim, will let, he'll, let a, he'll let anybody come in off the streets and join the troupe. And I love that because he makes, he makes people feel valuable. And for the community, I think the troupe makes the community feel valuable with the issues that they go through every day that might not have a voice, you know what I'm saying? In one of my songs, I say voice of the voiceless. I pride myself on being the voice for the people that can't speak or don't have the courage to speak up. So I feel like the Romero troupe is a voice for the people to speak up. You know, it's a community feel, so you just jump right in. No one's professional, so, you know, there's not really the... Um, the need to be like super great at what you do, but you just try to get the message across and have some fun while you're doing it. And you can tell by the way that the audience responds that it's really working and that it's not so much about every single little detail being perfect or that I had to get everything perfect in what I was doing, but it was that the conveyance to the audience worked beautifully. The Romero Troupe is never the same troupe. Not only from one year to year, or from one show to show, but even from one week to the next. <laughs> it's a constantly transforming, um, fluid group of people. The chemistry is constantly evolving and changing and flowing because of new people that are, that are coming in and being involved. Um, other people come into busy places in their lives where they need to flow out for a while. And so it's, it's never, ever the same chemistry. The truth is we, we don't know who's going to be there from one rehearsal to the next because we're an all-volunteer model, an all-volunteer cast. And so we're constantly making adjustments, plugging new people in, trying out different approaches. And so we never actually have a full-on rehearsal that goes from front to back. <laughs> when I first got involved in the troupe, I was really upset about some things that were going on politically and sometimes it feels like you don't have a voice and you don't have a say. But in a little way you do have a big voice with the Romero troupe and even if someone else is writing the scene, because it's organic theater, there's never really a script. Someone might write down like, this is what I intend to have happen, but it never actually ends up being exactly what you intended because there might be completely different actors in the scene the next time you perform it. I really appreciate they still like, they consider everyone part of the troupe, like, you know, everyone decides. So I, I feel I am part of it, even though I've just started with them because they make me feel that way. After a while, there's nothing new for, for the people in the troupe to discover in the performance and then it just becomes kind of a, a performance instead of a discovery, then we usually know it's time to move on. And even though people want us just to keep going, we, we vote. <laughs> and uh, invariably, uh, everybody seems, or the majority seem to know it's time to, to move on. And then uh, it just depends on how, uh, with Jim's schedule, everybody's schedule, how soon we can start to create a new, a new show. And it's such a, a, a curious process because we start basically with n nothing. But if we get one scene that works, it seems to instill this confidence. And then, then it starts to take off. We'll practice a scene and then there will be totally different reactions. Someone will say, I really didn't like that part. I didn't think that was effective. Where, And then someone will be like, no, that was like the best part. We need it, you know? And so it's, that's, that's a really interesting part of the process. And it's really fun. Some of our best performances have been in rehearsal and uh, they were never captured uh, by the audience didn't see it or any media, but, but we know, you know? And uh, 
And that's part of where the bonds and the troop come from. The kind of sharing we have, the kind of trust. Uh, in that sense, uh, it's been a very inspirational uh, thing to be part of because it kind of shows to me that society could be organized differently, less hier hierarchical and uh, more mutual and more respect for each person. Are they going to be here while you teach? They're experts. <laughs> okay, students. Hoy la lección va a ser. <laughs> After five successful years of Romero Troop performances, James Walsh ran into trouble in his classroom. Four years ago, a uh, former chair in our department tried to, tried to get rid of me. She just walked into my office one day and said that my contract would not be renewed for the following year. I knew why, even though she didn't say it. The excuses were the budget, there were budget cuts and that my dissertation wasn't finished, but those were excuses. She had said things like, you've chosen to do other things with your time, and I knew those other things were Romero Troop. I didn't know what to do on that day. I, I went home, thought about it, went for, for a run, and then decided in my sweat of running that I needed to, I needed to st speak up and say, this isn't right. I always felt that the way he impacts students was so profound. Even working at the university, I would have so many students tell me how much they like Jim and his courses, I never heard one bad thing about Jim. Everybody loved him. So right away, it was just like, well, how could the university do this to somebody? Two days later, I went into her office, sat down very respectfully, and explained to her that I wasn't going away. <laughs> she was taken by this because I'm contingent faculty. I don't have tenure, so I don't have security. So. Her reaction was a bit, she was shocked, I think a bit stunned, and maybe even chuckled to herself a little bit. This, this, who does he think he is? <laughs> and then before I knew it, um, my students were organizing. Um, it started in the Romero Troop and flowed from there. There was some committee that tried to have a meeting with her and she refused. There was a letter writing campaign, there was a rally planned on campus, there was an article in the UCD Advocate. Ten days after the campaign started, really less than two weeks after the, I was given the news, I got a call from the dean and I went into his office and he said, I'm, I'm overruling this decision and reinstating you. So everything we try to do in the Romero Troop about empowerment and about activism and about so solidarity, I felt in that moment you see people um, sorry I think I get emotional. <laughs> you, see, you see people going to bat for you and in your soul you, you ask, you know, why? <clears throat> It's, it's, it's the most beautiful of kind of human affirmation and um, vindication that the work you're doing is, is important. From that moment on, I knew who I worked for. And it was not a department, it was not a chair, it was students. After his victory, Dr. Walsh felt a new level of confidence and poured that energy into the Romero Troop. Over the course of the next few years, the troop grew like never before. And every semester, new students are introduced to Dr. Walsh's methods. And every semester, new people find a place to share their struggles in the Romero Theater Troupe. You know, my whole take on the, the mainstream media is that it just, maybe from today on, should be shut down because I think their uh, ability to address any legitimate social justice issue is weak to non-existent and I think um, you know it's easy to trace or to understand why when you look at who owns the the media 
Yeah, with the, you turn on the mass media, and the first thing you're gonna see in the morning is like, oh, the uh, the opening bill to Wall Street's about to open. It's just, you just know right there that the mass media is for the rich. If you have a media source, I feel personally that pumps truth over rhetoric, you're gonna have a revolution on your hands. The governed can be controlled by by control of opinion. If you can control their attitudes and beliefs and uh, separate them from one another and so on, then they won't rise up and overthrow you. In 1988, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman wrote a book called Manufacturing Consent. The book presents a political and economic analysis of the overall structure and limitations of corporate mass media. In the book, the author suggests that media is significantly influenced by five major filters. These filters impact not only what news is presented to the general public, but how it is presented. Those filters are 1. Concentration of ownership, whereby smaller media firms are purchased by larger corporate media systems, narrowing the range of messages available to the public. 2. Revenue through advertising. This allows advertisers significant power of the kinds of messages available to the general public. If an advertiser doesn't approve of a particular news story, it can withdraw its funding. This filter also keeps media outlets interested in keeping ratings as high as possible. A single percentage point drop in ratings can represent a change of 80 to 100 million dollars in annual revenue. 3. Sourcing of information. This includes the strategic placement of journalists, where news is most likely to happen, as well as the incorporation of approved experts. Experts can come in many forms, government officials, public relations firms, and consultants. Academics or expert witnesses, often on corporate payroll, can be sourced to present a narrative that reinforces the official story. 4. Flack and Discipline Campaigns designed to punish the media for statements that cross any kind of political or ideological boundary. These include pushback from ad campaigns, alterations in public policy, lawsuits, letter writing campaigns, or anything else designed to cost media companies time and money and dissuade them from presenting an alternative picture. 5. Anti-Communism Because the media is largely controlled by corporate systems, the media's message is necessarily in support of established market forces. Any news story that does not exist within the capitalistic worldview is often shot down or highlighted and called socialist and communist. The market, and those who have strong ties to it, is thus protected from wider critique. Each of these filters significantly limit the agency of media systems and limits the narratives that are shared with the public. As a news event enters the arena, the five filters go to work in the background, determining not only if the story will be presented to the general public, but how it will be presented to the public. This allows for the continuous reproduction of culture through the creation of narratives that support the consolidation of power in the hands of the already powerful. Some of the most effective kinds of, co of propaganda are the kinds that allow you to see what's going on. So you see uh, 99%, 1%, but to feel, I can't do anything about it. I'm you know, isolated, alone, uh, I don't talk to anybody. Uh, uh, people like me can't do anything. We're just uh, we just have to suffer and bear. Uh, that's really effective propaganda. I mean, that's the way. Uh, that's how slavery could last f forever without many slaver rebellions. It's how uh, uh, women were oppressed. One might ask, what about journalists? There are definitely some fantastic journalists out there sharing dynamic and well-written stories that challenge the status quo. However. One journalist by the name of Nick Davies led a study in 2008. The study examined 2,000 news articles published by four major British news organizations. The study revealed that of those 2,000 articles, only 12% were written based on research done by journalists. The rest of the stories were largely constructed by the public relations industry, government sources, and other news agencies. Thus, the ability for journalists to act and change the narrative is limited. But another main reason large-scale media is problematic is that it attempts to focus on large-scale pictures, often overgeneralizing complex issues that require a great deal of time and discussion to understand. 
Issues that center around communities are often, but not always, lost in a sea of large geopolitical news cycles. You need to hear our voice. If we're poor, if we're dispossessed, if we're homeless, you know, we need to be heard. And we want to be heard now. And we want to be heard loudly. Many scholars now believe that independent media holds the answer. YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and a host of other systems act as a form of resistance. They act as a means of addressing local concerns and can represent local culture. In particular, community media represents an opportunity for locally based media systems. People want to feel engaged, I think. They want to feel part of their community. And that's one of the things that Romero Troop does, is tries to provide that um, sense of community, which is very much uh, being diminished or under attack in our you know, hyper-individualist society. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, defines community media as characterized by their accountability to the communities they serve. They emerge as a result of popular movements that strive to attain an important space in citizen participation and demand the right to own and operate free from political and commercial interference. The Romero Theater Troupe uses theater as a space for creating community media. If you look at how theater has evolved through history, you can see this model. We didn't invent this. Um, people have been educated through theater forever. It, back to the ancient Greeks and way before then. And so it's in our DNA to watch ourselves play ourselves and laugh and feel and cry and walk away thinking, I'm a different person. You know, I've done a lot of political and, and um, activist kind of work and uh, nothing's more powerful than um, theater. I've come to learn that. You weren't relocated, well, sort of. But we were put into concentration camps. Guard towers, manned by military police. And we were there for well over three years. The Fifth Amendment to the Constitution states that no American shall be deprived of life or liberty without due process of law. No American. We were American citizens born in the USA. We had done no wrong. There were no charges, no trial, no justice. Here in the heartbeat mountains, I'm trying to find my roots. But the soil is too dry. This, this is a dream. I'm having a dream. I mean, why, why is it that you guys even care? I don't even, I don't even know your names. I don't even know your names. I'm Faith. I'm Hope. <laughs> I'm, I'm Captain America. <laughs> When I began working with the Romero Troop, I offered to volunteer my several years of experience in media in exchange for allowing me to do my master's research. In addition to following the troop with a camera, I conducted demographic surveys of the Romero Troop and their audience, administered questionnaires to their audience members both before and after viewing a performance, and conducted 19 interviews on past and present members of the Romero Troop. The data that emerged from my research brought to light three themes in how the Romero Troop impacts its community. The first, power. Through increasing community and individual agency, the Romero Troop offers a place for individuals and communities to feel empowered and encourages them to stand up for themselves. Second, by building solidarity and developing social cohesion, the Romero Troop provides a central community for extensive networking. Third, it creates a space for individuals and communities to represent themselves, rather than co-opting their narratives. 
Through its performances and workshops, the Romero Troop acts as an interventionist strategy against the established systems of unequal power known as structural violence. Is this notion of violence that is, for the most part, invisible, symbolic, normalized, those kinds of things that are institutionalized in a way that keep people from achieving their right to life and happiness. And so it isn't necessarily a very tangible thing that you can point to, but rather it has more to do with kind of structures that are very much embedded in the political economy, as well as even things like media, that, that continue through policies, institutions, and structures to keep things in a way in which people are not able to live in dignity and to achieve everything that they can. Every human being faces oppression. Every one of us faces some form of oppression. For some, it's much deeper and much more unimaginable than for others. But everyone faces oppression, and that seeps into us. It seeps, in, it gets into our veins, it gets into our, into our organs, and it begins to weigh us down. I think that structural uh, violence in, in media really it comes again with kind of this abstract representation or misrepresentation of homogenized groups of people or linking ideologies or linking perceptions to different people that may or may not be true and then just reinforcing that. Immigration is a really big example of that as potentially immigrants being very dangerous to our community. All of them are either illegal, they are utilizing precious resources or wasting resources here in the United States that that we shouldn't be squandering. The Romero Troop often includes those who lack a voice. Nowhere is this more true than through the plight of undocumented individuals. Immigration, the topic of a whole nation. Which side are you on when it comes to race relations? Immigrants take death rides to the land of patience so they can work harder for partial payments. You come to this hotel for a nice getaway or a conference? I come to this hotel to work 12 to 15 hour shifts at minimum wage just to get by. You tell me to get to the back of the line so I can work legally, yet I've been waiting in a line that doesn't exist for 15 years. You tell me that I'm the one taking advantage of the system when these corporate executives know full well that they're taking advantage of the most vulnerable people in this country, including some citizens who are also victims of wage theft. I say enough is enough. Help me end wage theft now. Nosotros contamos nuestra historia en una, en una presentación, en una obra que ellos tuvieron y la verdad pues nos ayudó bastante porque pues tuvimos la oportunidad de, de la gente que fue a ver la obra, eh, estuvo firmando, um, dándonos firmas como para meter en, la, en nuestra petición que teníamos por Facebook. So ellos nos apoyaron con, las personas que fueron ahí nos apoyaron con, con las firmas, entonces yo pienso que es importante para dar a conocer nuestra historia, para que pues... Um, vean que no estamos en la sombra, que, que, que nosotros queremos sacar toda la luz y, y ver la injusticia que se está cometiendo con muchas personas, porque no nada más somos nosotros, sino que son muchas familias que están así como nosotros en este caso, que hubo el problema de migración, so por eso yo pienso que es importante. I'm an immigrant myself, I, um, and I know what people go through personally, and now I am a naturalized citizen, but I still have a lot of family that are undocumented and, and it's, it's painful just knowing how hard life for them is. What is my nephew going to do when he's older? He did not know his father. He left when he was six years old because he had to follow the law. But you don't look at the humanity part of saying, these are families that are separated. These are families that, how can you separate mom and dad and child? 
I, uh, I don't know what you're saying. I'm gonna need to see some form of identification, please. Pero por qué me está parando? I'm gonna ask you this one more time. Do you have papers? Papeles? Most people don't even know that there is an immigration detention center here in uh, what's well, right out in, in Aurora. And they detain people there that, you know, mostly just working people, people that were going to work, um, got stopped on the way to work because of a broken windshield or whatever. And they're detained there in, a, in this private detention center um, that GEO runs, GEO Corporation. And uh, they get paid uh, like $135 a day per person that's in there. And, you know, that's just so wrong. I mean, what's the motive, motivation to fix the problem when you're making money off of it? The crazy thing is, is it's a civil case. Um, if you're undocumented, it's not a criminal offense, it's a civil offense. But still, they put them in detention, or they call it detention, but it's nothing but jail. Because it's a civil case, you're not it's not required to have legal representation, so unless you can pay for it, you know, you don't have a lawyer. We know people that have been in the detention center for a year or longer. Just it all seems so clearly tied to the issue of wealth and power and lack of wealth and power and the disparity. So uh, recognizing that individuals who are recipients or the um, targets of immigration policy or discourse about immigration. Very specific vignettes and theater performances or sections in a performance that deal with immigration. Um, that has helped me understand the issue better, but also understand from the individuals themselves, whether through the actors themselves or the individuals who are the performers themselves, about how people are impacted by immigration policy in Colorado but also how the people impact the policy itself. Jim calls it the mask scene, or it got labeled the mask scene. And uh, people are wearing these masks, and uh, just white, plain white masks, and uh, walking around unaware of, of the immigration problem and the fact that people are in detention. And uh, somebody comes up, and they, they grab somebody, and, and they form them form a wall with their hands and, and lock them in detention. The mainstream media, immigration is a, a public debate based on statistics and Republican versus Democrat dysfunction. <laughs> For Meritroop, immigration is stories of humble and sometimes desperate human beings trying to struggle to help their families and to search for a little bit of a safer and more comfortable existence. Para pues nosotros no queremos ser deportados. Nuestros hijos son ciudadanos americanos. Yo sé que tienen un futuro por delante, que ellos pues tienen sueños que cumplir, quieren ser alguien en la vida, cosa que nosotros por la extrema pobreza no pudimos pero yo quisiera que ellos sí cumplieran sus sueños y por eso estamos luchando hoy. Hemos conocido um, varias organizaciones como EIFC y este, um, estamos luchando con nuestro caso y luego también este Romero Teatro y todo eso estamos uh, luchando también con toda la comunidad, muchas personas que nos están apoyando. We're really about uh, trying to persuade people and uh, find common humanity. In a lot of ways, that's where social change really happens, is where, like in Speak American, there were several people who said to us after the performance, I'm going to have to completely rethink my views on immigration. We, we touched them in such an extent. Uh, I don't think a rational argument, a lecture, would have produced that kind of change. Yeah, I think that we just know that these situations and these stories bring up a lot of real emotions and that it's somewhere that we can express those things without fear of judgment or being called this or that for feeling that way. The issues that the Romero Troop tackles, the vast, vast majority of them are not 
easy things. And if someone were to simply talk to you about them and give you a lecture or give you the facts about them, you could end up leaving super depressed and just kind of want to crawl in a hole and not feel very good about society. But the way that the Romero Troupe does it, using humor, using um, emotion, and using theater to bring out aspects of stories that show the humanity. So I think the way the Romero Troupe brings all those things together um, creates an atmosphere, a positive atmosphere, that people want to want to make change and want to see change and view that something else is possible. Telling stories in personal ways, that that has an impact. Whereas if we, if we tell them in broad ways, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't, it, 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 it engages the intellect, but it doesn't engage the soul. Because Romero doesn't have this focus on product um, beyond, you know, wanting to do something that is relevant and, and invites participation from, from the communities that, it, that the troupe is in conversation with. Um, there's a lot of space, there's a lot of room for, uh, for relationships um, to form, for people to bring themselves into the space and not, and, you know, we don't have to really check anything at the door. One of our scenes is about a homeless man named Billy, and that, and that scene I think captures our whole mission. This is why it's so emotional when we, when we perform it and when we practice it, is that the bare essence of that scene is that every human being has goodness within them. Human beings are inherently good. This is the greatest of life's lessons. It was taught to me by Billy, a man without a home or a friend. Billy was an alcoholic drifter. Spent a lot of time in jail. All of the sheriffs and deputies knew him. They all called him a mean drunk. I met Billy at Denver County Jail while I was working as a new case manager. When I asked the sheriff to bring Billy down from his cell so I might talk with him, the sheriff replied, Why would you want to talk to him? I, he would tell me about, you know, the fact that nobody would talk to him. He'd go like days without speaking to anybody. And there would, nobody would ever call his name. I mean, so it's these little things that you can do for people, the homeless or not, smile at people and walking down the street smiling and say hi and say, hey, I see you. You know, and you recognize that you're, you're walking right next to another human being. I kept checking on Billy, finding him in the morning on the street, making sure he made it through the night. I spent a lot of time walking around with Billy, talking to him. Billy began to open up to me and we became close. The Billy that I came to know was quiet and caring, scared and sad, almost out of hope. He told me, told me that no one had ever checked up on him before or looked for him. He cried once when he told me that his family had shunned him, but he didn't blame them. He'd made a lot of mistakes. He once told me that he was scared that he would die and that no one would care. Billy was like my um, Buddha. He taught me so much. and. I, but I learned from his suffering, right? And he died a really violent death. Uh, here I am, you know, living you know, a fairly comfortable life, a very beautiful life. And, you know, and what right do I have? You know, I don't know, a lot of really hard feelings come up. Yeah, it's, it's hard every time I even think about it. He taught me not to judge others, that every one of us is worthy. The people who are the hardest to love are the ones who need it the most. In my work and in my life, as I encounter people living on the streets, I try to remember Billy and do what I can for them without judgment. I try to listen to them, to convey to them I try to see everyone on the street, to recognize them as people, to say hi to them. This is a small thing, but Billy taught me that it matters.
I think we push the limits a lot. I think we say some things that might make people uncomfortable. Um, we, you know, try to challenge your own thoughts and why you think what you think. Um, I don't think we're trying to persuade anybody either way. I think we're just telling stories and the whole story. And from um, a perspective of someone who might not be able to share their story otherwise. In 2009, Alex Landau was pulled over for a routine traffic stop. The result? Racial profiling and police brutality. Who knew he'd be a witness to the reality of police brutality? Yes, officer. No, I don't. I'm sorry. Maybe you leave left turn back there. Oh, my bad. I didn't even know that there was... You couldn't make left turns right there. Did you see your license and registration? The moment was still. Silence. Condensation clung to the peeling tint on the outside of the glass windows. Then, as I was ordered from the vehicle, get out of the car, put your hands on the hood. He patted my pockets. I did not know my rights, pat pat. A black youth who matched a profile. Anxiety, any knife needles, guns, and narcotics, pat pat. My blood pressure increased. I could feel my heart begin to beat. Okay, go stand by my car. How did this happen? I didn't recall a sign prohibiting a left turn. <laughs> it's cold. I'm just trying to go home. Why does he need this additional squad car? Are we in danger? Do we need to be afraid for our lives? These are questions that I did not know that I needed to ask myself. My friend is in handcuffs. He may receive a ticket, but who knew? Who knew he'd be a witness to the reality of police brutality? or excessive force to soften the words so the city can hear you. Who knew he would be pressured into false statements of events to pretend? They told him, that nigger's not your friend. He'd do the same to you, but would they do the same to him? Is it an ism, or is it system, or is it both? And can we all be victims? Excuse me, can I just see a hey, you sit right there, what the? You didn't have it. You don't know how lucky you are, son. You almost got your head blown off. Where's that word now, you fucking nigger? Protect and serve, I thought. At least that's what I was taught. But what I was taught is not reality. Can I see a warrant? Does that warrant three Denver cops to grab, beat, and tackle me? Life thrown off track, but wait. I'm a student. A brother to a beautiful sister. The son of a strong mother and father. A young man of color, but yet, I'm face down in the gutter and I ask you, why? Why am I dying from being beaten so badly? Why do the police laugh and call me nigger? Victimized. Just another Jim Crow hate crime. And as the shock clutches my body, I think to myself, will I survive? Will I live to see 21? The answer is yes. Is there any other option? Yes, I am not a statistic. Yes, I will not be another dead 19 year old black male. Yes, I will be a voice for all victims and survivor of such violence. Yes, I will fear none and give way to no oppression. And no, I will not give you a statement until an attorney is present. And yes, I am demanding photos be taken prior to any treatment. And so the theater troupe itself, the members, their performances are part of a larger context in which they are promoting uh, momentum that allows uh, for direct action, allow for demonstrations, allow for individual acts of resistance where people uh, assert themselves in their own workplace or in their own community. So the discussions perpetuated, promoted by the Romero troupe are fundamental, 
but they're also just one small part of the larger momentum and set of steps that the Romero Troop is involved in, which is you know, the ultimate goal to promote social equity, to democratize media, to try to make uh, uh, education and performance uh, accessible to more people than just you know, spending $50 or $100 per ticket to see uh, a more corporate kind of performance. Twelve times in Colorado history, the National Guard's been used against its own people. What? And that could, do you think it would Just happen again? Labor history isn't a Disney history. <laughs> it's a history of struggle. So many things seem to come down to class. Now I know, I mean, in this country, we have such a history of racism that that tends to cover up the class. But I think class is, Class has always been important to me as sort of the defining issue about what's wrong and what we need to do. In 2009, the Romero Theater Troupe did a play entitled, Which Side Are You On? It was a play about the history of labor, stories about the struggles and victories in the face of overwhelming odds. You're learning who built this country now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before it was the immigrants, Slaves, the shoulders of slaves now. Indigenous slaves, African slaves. Their blood, their sweat now. Built your White House and your capital. The play was a tribute to those who had lost their lives due to poor working conditions. It was about standing up for workers in the face of profit margins, stock prices, and corporate greed. And those who had died fighting for dignity and respect in the workplace. But mostly, it was a play about courage and solidarity. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? All right, let's go. Come on, let's go. 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 They called Cesar Chavez a communist. Me pa taught me once. He said, when they call you a communist, it means you're doing something right. <laughs> but the Romero Theater Troupe's discussion of labor didn't stop there. This time, instead of tales of history, they focused on the plight of a group of custodians who worked on the troops' home base, Auraria Campus. This has been the greatest education I've had about Auraria Campus, and I think everyone in the Romero Troop has ever had about this campus. Um, I want to say a word about the message of this play. This, the message of this play is not anger, it's not bitterness. Uh, the message of this play is hope. Uh, the message of this play is help. <laughs> help, help, help. Uh, these workers need you. They need students and faculty uh, to speak up, to stand up, to, to say something, to get involved. The custodians at Honorary Campus, people would think that's like the least important thing happening on the campus where all these great minds are being developed. But like Professor Walsh has said in the past, if you, if you overlook the, the invisible people or the smallest people in the chain of command, then who are we really? Excuse me. Excuse me. That's cool. Can I get by? Oh, no, I mean, I, I'm sitting here. I'm studying. <laughs> uh, We're having a study group here, so <laughs> right. if you mind going around. We'd yeah, that, that'd be great. I mean, we, we do pay tuition here, so, you know, we have a right to Please, do. excuse me. Oh, yeah, but... Uh, Please. Um, sorry. She needs to get through, guys. Come on. Well, Look. 
We don't care. Go around. We're studying. Oh, come on, man. He's, come on. Uh, she just needs to get through it. Get back, sit down, do Excuse whatever you want to do. You know what? Just, Fine. Just stand up. It's not worth it anyway. I just think that they're, they feel so invisible all the time. They get taken for granted. And so to have a platform uh, to let people know I'm here, I'm a human being, I'm doing this for you, uh, that gives them a self-worth that they don't feel all the time. Rosita, clean. Clean. I know you don't clean. That is your job. And your job too. You forgot to clean the, the hallway. No, no. Okay. How come you didn't clean the hallway? The work is hard and they know it and they're willing to just like toil and, and, and push and 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 just give give it their best. But it's when they're demeaned that that's when that line is crossed. Marcella, you are not done yet. Get back to work. I was just in classroom 1067 and it is filthy. Why didn't you clean it? Hey, 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 you guys go on home. You, 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 you clocked out, you did your work, thank you, goodbye. Well, if you if you had not been so slow, so lazy, you would have gotten all your work done, so you go finish now. Yeah, yeah, you just be it total. The tables are all. No, they're dirty. No, they aren't. They're 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 dirty. The way that the Teatro Romero did not uh, appropriate their stories, but rather they worked in partnership with with the custodians, and and so it was it was done together. And the custodians had never been treated as equals by professionals. I've never done any acting before. I wouldn't even know where to begin, but I had a lot of fun. I told you oh. not to talk about the union at work. Estamos en el noche. I don't care if it's your lunch. No talking about the union at work. Alegre. Yo, yo, yo sentía esa, esa a, a, a alegría por, por lo mismo que, que alguien que estaba trabajando en nombre y siguiendo los mismos pasos del Cardenal Romero, yo, yo sabía que nos iban a ayudar y, 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 y que estaban aquí para ayudarnos. project about what to expect. The place was full and it was a cold snowy day and people came from a lot of different places in the community to see to see the play. And though the play was well received by the community, it was not necessarily well received by Ahab. Ellos se hacen disimulados. Ellos se hacen como que no son ellos. What they did was just like break them up into separate buildings. And this just goes to show you the arrogance of management. To think that the reason why they, they were all in the union was because they could just get along and they were just troublemakers. And if you could just break them apart, the problem would be solved. We're, we're only fighting for our rights. Everybody's just fighting for the rights. After the custodian play, the union grew in strength, but AHEC grew more resistant. The Romero troop and several non-profit organizations called a meeting on campus with students and faculty. We, we did a play on campus here towards the end of last semester. That got some support, but also elicited some uh, retribution. Um, and so the, the right to stand up for themselves is being uh, challenged. We are all human beings, and we all earn a living in different ways. And that the custodians are not an extension of the appliance they're using to clean a building. 
at the meeting, a march in solidarity with students, faculty, and custodians was organized to make their grievances known to the wider campus community. An absolutely beautiful day to be marching for justice and respect for the people who perform a necessary function on this campus. Without the custodians, we wouldn't be able to teach, we wouldn't be able to learn, and uh, they have not been getting a fair shot with management, with AHEC, and that's what this march is all about. The abuses that are faced by these workers go without saying, and don't let any of the slick explanations fool you. Anytime hardworking people take to the streets and put their livelihoods, the ability to feed their families on the line, you know it's for a valid reason. Those who administer this campus are counting on one thing, that when the most vulnerable among us are abused, that the rest of us won't care. You say now. Dignity. Now. Dignity. Now. When I say respect, you say now. Respect. Now. Respect. Now. I will no longer stand for the continuous disrespect of our community. How many of the custodians will have to endure wage theft? How many times will custodians be disrespected for asking for fairness in the workplace? How many times will custodians put their health at risk on our campus? How many times will custodians be asked to reduce their hours and lose earnings? How many times will custodians be treated as invisible when they clean campus classrooms and offices? Dignity now! Justice, you say now! Justice! Now! Justice! Now! When I say respect, you say now! Respect! Now! Respect! Now! We are here! We are here! In solidarity! To stand in solidarity! With those workers! With those workers! We are demanding respect! We are demanding respect! We are demanding equitable work! We are demanding equitable work! We are demanding fair work! We are demanding fair work! At the conclusion of the march, 12 janitors and numerous supporters walked to the downtown Denver Equal Employment Opportunity Office and filed a grievance against AHEC. The march caught the attention of Denver CBS News 4 and the Denver Post, making the custodian's plight visible to the wider public. In the history of labor, it is those that persist who prevail. Though the struggles with the custodians isn't over, they are no longer invisible to those who work alongside them. Próximamente nos reunimos con Teatro Romero para continuar la, nuestra lucha que empezamos. No vamos a parar hasta lograr nuestro objetivo, que nos respeten como trabajadores. Leaves were rustling I'm, like the thoughts in my head. I can't quite describe. I, I know. I remember this. <laughs> and this is this is from the civil rights movement, right? C C I O and and this is from I remember seeing these um, in 2004 uh, with the uh, invasion of, of Iraq and. In Vietnam and, well, I don't know what that word means. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> boycott grapes. Why would you boycott grapes? <laughs> you guys are troublemakers. <laughs> huh? You guys know. We are love makers. This is what we do. But we are getting older and might not be around much longer. And who will plant the seeds when we are gone? You think this stuff is gonna, you think this stuff is gonna help you change the world? No, we do it so that the world doesn't change us. Got it? It's not just Latino rights. It's not just 
immigration rights. It's not just gay rights. It's not just homeless. You know, the the it's not just one thing. It's human. There, like, it's a human cause. It's a human belief. Like, we find the beauty in every human. I think it offers a model that is very different from anything, from most things we see in society. Um, I think it offers a model where anyone who's willing to work is welcome, um, where a variety of voices are welcome, and where a shared vision can be achieved through very non-traditional methods. I've had to realize, you know, are, are we having a really substantive impact? It's not clear that we are. But we're changing a few people and we change ourselves in the process. And I mean, that experience of solidarity is a very powerful experience. And it's something you draw on if there's an opportunity to have it expressed in a wider way. And, uh, you know, you're keeping hope alive, too. And that's, that's a valid thing to do. There's some real benefit to a person's being to, um, to get in touch with those stories inside of us, those real experiences that are, whether they're painful or not, you know, I mean, still, it's, it's very much part of, of who we are, you know, and if, <laughs> if I tell you my story and you tell me your story, well, then we, if we know each other, we're connected somehow. History, yeah, it could be boring for some, but truly, we're still leaving it. The Romero Theater Troupe acts as a pivotal center of gravity for activism in the Denver community. As the troupe has grown, so its involvement has spread to numerous nonprofit organizations, churches, universities, conferences, and more. The people in the group are so very friendly to everybody. Uh, there's a wonderful atmosphere of uh, friendship and caring in, in that group that I've, I've never seen in any other group. The Romero Troop in that Wheels of Life is teaching me, man, to speak up for yourself, express yourself, man, because if you don't, somebody will express how they think you feel. And that's the worst thing in the world for somebody to tell you how you think you feel when you have a voice and you have the energy to say how you feel. By offering a space that empowers community members, gives them a voice, and then builds solidarity, the Romero Theater Troupe is gradually becoming a powerful force of cultural change in Colorado, one that offers hope, dignity, and compassion. After spending more than a year with the Romero Theater Troupe, I have seen courage, I have seen love, and I have seen radical transformation. The Romero Theater Troupe has taught me a lesson that I will never forget. It's not about what you do, but that you stop and listen to those around you. That you share your stories, your battle scars, and your triumphs. They taught me that we should be willing not only to lend our fellow brothers and sisters our ears, but also our hearts. Because it is only through compassion that we become unbound. In our things, both big and small Read the writing on the wall Hear the call, hear the call, hear the call Nothing can ever stop us When we rise up one and all Never fall, never fall, never fall
now written on the Of all things now said, if you recall, read the writing on the wall. Hear the call, hear the call, hear the call. Nothing can ever stop us when we rise up one and all. Never fall, never fall, never fall. Big or small, it's now written on the wall. 